Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Never Again, our event to mark Holocaust Memorial Day. This event and Holocaust this event and Holocaust Memorial Day cannot be underestimated. We stand in solidarity with Jewish, Roma, Gypsy, Slav communities, trade unions, socialists, communists, and all communities mass murdered by the Nazis as we mark the 77th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz. This day must remind us all of the need to unite all those opposed to racism and fascism to ensure that such horrors are never again repeated, which means putting aside differences on all other issues. The theme of this year's Holocaust Memorial Day is one day where we take action today so that there is a future without genocide one day in the future. I'd like to introduce our first speaker, who was just a child when the Nazis occupied France in 1940. Colette Levy from France was sent into hiding by her parents who were later killed in the Holocaust. Colette is a lifelong and tireless campaigner against fascism, the far right and all forms of racism. And we're delighted that Colette Levy is here to join us. Thank you. My name is Colette, Colette Livy. I was born in France in 1936 in a suburb of Paris called Courbevoie. My mother was French, but not of a Jewish background. She was born in Partenay, which is a small uh, town in the county of Deux Sèvres, located below the, the Loire Valley. My father, Salomon Levy, L-E-V-Y, was born in France of Jewish Sephardic parents, born in Turkey. His family had been expelled from Spain at the end of the 15th century by the Inquisition in Spain. In the summer of 1941, he was arrested at the railway station of Courbevoie. He had been hiding in an attic near our flat, but he was getting restless and decided to go to Paris. At the railway station, he had to show his identity papers in which was written his name and labeled as a, with an inverted comma, a race case. He was taken to the transit camp of Drancy outside Paris. He stayed there for a year and a half until November, 1942 when he was deported to Auschwitz, an exter extermination camp. He never returned. In 1942, my mother decided that the, the, her twins, Nicole, my sister, and myself, Colette, and here is a photo of them, if you want to, to see the two of us. Yeah? Yes? Um, and we had to go into hiding in a free zone, which was still free until uh, the end of uh, uh, 1943. So it was still outside the area of the Vichy, Vichy government. She put us on a train on our own, age only six and a half. We nearly jumped out of the train when, when it slowed down crossing a station, which we thought was our destination. We were collected at Poitiers, the local town, and taken to my mother's small town called Partenay. We were staying with the cousins of my maternal grandfather, but they neglected us, so we were moved to a tiny village called Sansec sur Vienne. We stayed with our other cousins of my grandfather. The woman who looked after us was called Leon Grousset. She was a wonderful woman. Here she is. She was an orphan, uh, married to a man who worked at the village bakery, making bread. Leon was very good to us. The family was very poor, but looked after us well. We were going to school, but our names were not entered on the registry of the school as the village was partly collaborating 
with uh, the Finnish government under Peter, who was now allied to the Nazi regime. We did not play with the local children as many parents of these kids were on the Vichy side. Yeah. We were baptized in the Catholic church and went to church on Sundays, although we were atheists like our parents. In August 1944, a battalion of the Wehrmacht occupied the village for a week. They had gathered the men on the cattle field to be shot. The women, children and old people were going to be uh, put in the church and which was going to be set on fire. They had already destroyed the nearby village of Oradoub sur Glane. They claimed that the resistance, who were quite active in the area, had stolen the gold they had kept in a cache, gold that the Nazis had collected from the population, raiding houses, pulling out even gold teeth, and stealing jewelry. Our primary school teachers came from Alsace-Lorraine, which had been occupied earlier in 1870 by the Germans up to 1918, when it was returned to France after the First World War and became again German in 1940. Our teachers had emigrated to the free zone to avoid the Nazis. They spoke fluent German. They discussed with the Nazi commandant for six hours, telling him that they would be caught and killed and that it was the end of the war as Paris had already been liberated. Finally, the commandant decided to leave the village as he remembered that when he was a prisoner of the First World War, he had not been ill-treated by the French army. So the Nazis left the village and we escaped death. We were eight and a half years old. The trauma of that experience is still with me today. Now, my mother had to collect my father's dirty clothes from the Grand Sea, the transit camp. And when she returned them, she enclosed jars of tomato jam. In, in the collected clothes, uh, there were empty jars with messages from prisoners, from other prisoners of Drancy, placed under the lid. My mother sent them to, to their, their families as she was working for the administration of the post office. But it was discovered and she was nearly arrested. Now, let's speak about the French political situation, which is quite bad. The presidential elections will soon take place this year. The extreme right represented by Marine Le Pen and the, the, Rassemblement, Nation, the Rassemblement National. And also another, there's another candidate called Zemmour of Jewish background, but is also a racist, anti-Muslim, anti-everything, even anti-government. Jean-Marie Le Pen, the father of Marine Le Pen, had already poisoned French politics for five decades. And the population is still living with that now. The rural areas are often xenophobic and racist. Zemo declaring himself a candidate for the elections, presidential elections, at Colombelle les Deux Églises, the village where Charles de Gaulle lived. He is influenced by the extreme writer, writers of the 19th century, such as Barres, Maurras, Berville, he has expressed his disbelief about the innocence of Captain Dreyfus, accused of spying and deported in exile. Zemmour accused Emile Zola, the writer who defended Dreyfus, of not to be trusted as he was of Italian origin. There are also another 113 small groups of extreme rightists in France. That is quite deplorable. Let's speak now about the National Act, National Act of Pretty Patel here in Britain. If I were to come to Britain today as a refugee, I would not be able to get in 
This was the fate of many thousands of Jewish refugees trying to escape Nazism from France. After the war, the few who came back from the camp said never again, but the lesson has soon been forgotten. My sister and I survived to act as a testimony to a time when the Nazis and the fascists denied all democratic rights. In the Holocaust, the primary victims were the Jewish community, but they were not alone. Trade unionists, LGBTQ+, and the disabled, the political anti-fascists, many of them German. We should not forget that fascism is a political ideology, as it was known in Spain, France, Hung Hungary, Poland. Uh, there are organized, sorry, organized fascist groups who have returned today. In my lifetime, I, today, uh, uh, today yeah. in my lifetime, I lived under a Nazi regime, which was full of terror. I want to warn the younger generation now that history is repeating itself. I can for a moment pass on some wisdom. Firstly, I survived because of other people who were prepared to help. Human solidarity is always there. I was one of the lucky few, but my father was brutally murdered by the Nazi regime, and we should never forget that. That's it. Is that okay? Thank you. Thank you so much, Colette. It's always just so powerful to hear your first-hand story of what it was like to survive and live under Nazi persecution. So um, thank you so much for taking time out to join us this evening. It's just very powerful to um, hear your story and it just reminds everyone of the importance of um, campaigning against fascism to ensure that its rise is, is not repeated again, uh, as you mentioned um, with current examples. I'd now like to introduce our next speaker, who is the founder of the Sinti Roma Holocaust Memorial Trust, born into a Slovakian-Hungarian Roma musician family, the granddaughter of Sandor Abraham. Sandor, who died in 2000, was able to survive Nazi persecution because of his music, but hundreds of thousands of Roma were murdered during the Holocaust. Um, the Sinti Roma Holocaust Memorial Trust campaigned to remember the lost relatives and the living Roma and Sinti who are still affected to this day by the Nazi Holocaust. Um, and um, um, our next speaker has also organised um, opposition to fascist gangs in Slovakia who deny the Holocaust and violently attack minority groups. So I'd like to give a warm welcome to Daniela Abraham. Thank you so much uh, for the invitation on the Stand Up to Racism. Thank you for, so much for thinking of us, Cynthia and Roma, who have been also victims of the Holocaust. And as you said, I'm a descendant of the Roma Holocaust. Uh, we call it Samur Daripen in Romanes. And we are meeting basically here today to commemorate the victims of the Holocaust by the Nazis. Uh, every year, usually uh, I give speech about my family, uh, how uh, they have been affected during the summer Daripen. Uh, but this year I want to focus uh, on the current situation of the Roma in Britain and in Europe. Uh, I think everyone, everyone knows that uh, this kind of situation, uh, which is uh, many Roma now actually facing in Europe and uh, who are living in Europe, there is um, no need to further talk about it, like how they are living, yeah? Because uh, here I wanted to discuss the, the basically the situation where there is no progress. And I just wanted to ask those people who are behind this agenda in Europe and probably if this message will get to them, that uh, where is the billions uh, which have been invested in, in this kind of Roma in inclusion uh, strategy? I want to also know that uh, why, why we need to be stereotyped 
uh, in 21st century uh, still as thieves, criminals, and some kind of uneducated uh, people. And uh, I kind of disagree with, uh, with the media here in Britain as well, because what we can see uh, nowadays, the media is trying to show all these stereotypes that we are thieves, we are criminals, we are lazy, we don't want to work, but this is not the truth. I came here to Britain in 2007 and I did not have too much money in my pockets, right? But my ex-husband, he will have been working here and he is educated, he have university. Myself as well, I'm an educated woman. And there is many Roma, uh, the majority of the Roma and many Roma uh, are <laughs> educated. If even we are from the post community countries, but we work hard, we are also trying to contribute to the British society. Um, in Europe is the same. But <laughs> I'm very disappointed when I see uh, these so-called self-appointed leaders uh, in our community who doesn't have the mandate and uh, they are trying to make money out of the terrible situation of the Roma, most, most whom are even not even Roma, these leaders. And uh, if they are challenged, by people like me or other Roma activists um, that basically they does, doesn't have this mandate and uh, how dear they are trying to speak behalf of us. After the, <laughs> we are getting targeted, yeah, including myself uh, with, with some lies, slanders and attacks on our honor. And uh, there is double problem here first of all non-Roma who think they have the right to speak for the Roma. And secondly, some men who simply cannot accept that the woman can be a community leader too. So until these problems are addressed, we cannot make a progress. And uh, the progress can be reached if we will find a solution and there is a solution of course what i really want from all of you it doesn't matter where we came from if you are from britain from um, europe european country please try to use your hearts as well not just your brain and your pockets because our people are sold like the sheep on the market our Roma in Europe are sold like the slaves. And unfortunately, I see this in this country as well. Why? Why the Roma cannot have and cannot have the representation like any other nation? why we have to be oppressed and we cannot stand up for our rights, why we cannot speak loudly what is bothering us. How many years have to pass that we can give a future for, the, for good life for the future generation? And what is the solution for those who want the change? To silence them, kill them, target them, burn their houses, Maybe our harsh words, maybe some people wouldn't like what I'm saying today and they would disagree with me. But I'm working on the ground with my people, with the Roma here in Britain as well. And I'm disgusted by some of the NGOs, how they are using our community just for the money, but there is no enough help. I'm asking you as well, those who are want to do some changes and you were trying to help our Roma, please just think for one minute. That could be your daughter or your son. Don't use our people for money always. 
If you want to help them, you don't need money for it. Our team as well, we are trying to help these poor people in our community from our own pockets, from our own salary. And Britain gave us equal opportunities. In Europe, we, we did not have this. Thank you, Daniela. Could you please wind up? Yeah. In Europe, we don't have these opportunities, but I believe that the future generation will stood up and they will be like just as me or any of us. Who's, who are seeing this injustice and we, we want to make changes. We want to make changes on the ground. And it's the only way how we can do is the education. And this country, United Kingdom, gave us the equal opportunity for that education. Be nice to each other, respect each other, love each other. These words are very important. Thank you. Thank you, Daniela. Um, I'd like to um, remind everyone that this event here today is to remember the horrors of the Holocaust and to mark Holocaust Memorial Day in showing unity of all communities against fascism and racism. Our next speaker, I'm very pleased to welcome, um, uh, Ruth Levitas, who is a professor at um, University of Bristol, a professor in sociology, who's a longtime anti-fascist and researcher and niece of the wonderful uh, Cable Street veteran Max Levitas. Thank you, Ruth. Thank you, Sabi. Um, we do this week remember all the Jewish and other victims of the Holocaust as well as the victims of other atrocities and genocides before and since. And as the years pass, there are fewer survivors of the Shoah to bear direct witness to its horrors. So it is both a, a privilege to hear from a witness such as Colette um, and incumbent on us to listen, to really listen. But I think the impact of the Shoah remains with us, not just as historical memory, but in its effects on subsequent generations. My grandparents, Leah Rick and Harry Levitas, were among the millions of Jews who fled anti-Semitism in the Russian Empire between 1880 and 1914. And they ended up scattered across the world. Leah was one of four children joining her brothers and cousins in Dublin, where she and Harry married. One of Leah's brothers went to the United States, some of her cousins to South Africa, and her niece Frida to Israel. Harry was one of seven children. He had two sisters in London, two brothers in America, one brother in Paris. And by 1931, Harry and Leah were also in London. And we think of those Jews who were in Britain during the war, whether they came as refugees in the 1930s or earlier, as being safe. And that was not necessarily how it felt at the time because there was no certainty of victory. Cable Street in 1936, in which both my uncle Max and my father Maury participated, took place against rising fascism here. Um, and Max, as many of you know, went on fighting racism and fascism in the East End all his life. And my father went on to fight in Spain. But my aunt, my aunt Toby, Harry's youngest daughter, was just 11 years old when war was declared and 17 when it ended. It was Toby who, in 1945, had to complete on behalf of her parents multiple copies of Red Cross forms to try to locate relatives in Lithuania and Latvia to no avail because all of them had been killed. 
Leah's sister, Rachel, had remained in Riga with her husband and children, and most of the family died there in 1941. And I name them each year as an act of remembrance that they shall not be forgotten. Rachel Elka Rick Smargan, aged 63, her son Moshe, aged 39, Moshe's wife Xenia, aged 37, and their children Maya and Bela, aged three and one. Rachel's son Asher, aged 37, his wife Masha, and their son Mordecai, aged four. Etty, wife of Rachel's son Sholem, and their two daughters, Sila and Miriam, aged about 11 and nine. And Harry's sister Sarah and her family similarly died in their home village of Akmean in 1941, while their eldest brother, Elia Lieb Lebetetz, died in occupied Paris in 1944. There's now an extensive literature on intergenerational trauma, the way such terrible effect events affect not only those who experience them directly, but their relatives and descendants. Toby, who died in 2016, aged 88, carried the distress of those years all her life. She told me repeatedly that Hitler had planned to build a concentration camp in Victoria Park in East London. She grew up with a sense of terror. And for myself, although I was born in 1949, I can only say that that terror of fascism has been with me since childhood. Certainly since at the age of 10, I read Anne Frank's diary. And that sense of the fragility of the social order, of a potential collapse into barbarism, has never left me. The list of later examples, Rwanda, Bosnia, Myanmar, offers little comfort. So it frightens me that the new Nationality and Borders Bill extends the power of the Home Secretary to strip people of their British citizenship. This is not a new power, but what is new is removing the requirement to inform people. That makes it easier to remove citizenship from whole groups of people provided they are deemed entitled to citizenship elsewhere. And notably, that makes it possible to remove citizenship from British Jews. It's a comforting myth that Britain welcomed and provided safe haven for refugees in the 1930s. Numbers were strictly controlled and many were refused visas. Many died as a result. Many of those who were allowed in were interned as enemy aliens. The children who arrived on the kinder transports, like the Basque refugee children during the Spanish Civil War a little earlier, were admitted to Britain only with financial sponsorship by ordinary people. The state provided no assistance and their parents were abandoned to their fate. So our national government was not welcoming of strangers in need then and is not now. In recent months, we have seen images of desperate people aboard inflatable boats, including children, drowning in the English Channel because there are no safe routes into this country for refugees. People driven by war and persecution to try to find a place, a life elsewhere. And each of these people has a name and a story like my own relatives. Meanwhile, our government seeks to use the Navy to push these fragile craft full of fragile humans back out to sea and has tried to make their rescue illegal in breach of international law. Refugees are displaced by war, famine, social breakdown, persecution, and increasingly the effects of climate change. Racism, anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, xenophobia, thriving conditions of poverty, inequality, and insecurity, rife now as they were in the 1930s. These are very dangerous times. And for those refugees who do manage to arrive, there is often solidarity and support from ordinary people, as well as hostility and danger from others. Remembrance then 
must therefore also be a call to vigilance against the racisms, persecutions, and exclusions of our own time across the world, and to active support for the stranger seeking sanctuary. We all come from somewhere, and many bear the scars of those journeys. Thank you so much, Ruth. That was um, a really powerful speech. And thank you for warning us of the dangers of the Nationality and Borders Bill and the importance of defending refugee rights and opposing that piece of legislation. So thank you for that. Our next speaker is um, a British rabbi. He's president of Shomrin in Stamford Hill, chairman of the Arab Jewish Forum and chairman and founder of the Muslim Jewish Forum. Rabbi Gluck has been a consistent has been consistent in speaking out against racist division and far right attacks, and has been a campaigner for unity. So, um, uh, Rabbi Herschel Gluck, um, thank you for joining us today, and welcome. Thank you very much. It's very touching to hear all the previous speakers, and I must say I am emotionally. Uh, deeply moved uh, by their contributions. And I want to thank them, each and every one of them, for what they've said. The theme of this year's HMD is one day. And I think it is a very appropriate theme because when we look at the big picture of the Holocaust, we can be drowned in, in such a vast, immense sea of pain that the Holocaust expresses. And what we need to do, I think, is take one day. And I want to start with the 12th of March, 1938, the day of the Anschluss, the date when Germany annexed Austria, or others would say when Austria joined Germany in its fascist campaign. On that day, 12th of March, 1938, my mother was, was a 10-year-old child living in a small village in the Austrian countryside in Burgenland. The name of the village was Deutschkreuz, as the Jews called it, Salem. And up till then, the Jews of the village lived very, very well with the non-Jewish population. They were in and out of each other's homes. They fell through stones and attacked the Jewish community, including my mother's childhood home. There was a pogrom. And the very next day, on the 13th of March 1938, Salem became Judenrein. All the Jews were expelled from the village. and ended up in a ghetto in Vienna after about 500 years of living in this village. On the day in 1945, my father, who was 21 years old, a soldier in the British Army, participated in the liberation of Bergen-Belsen concentration extermination camp. And what he saw in that camp was hell on earth. But he didn't see this as an end. He saw this as a beginning 
to help the survivors continue to survive, and not just survive, but survive with dignity, with self-respect, with the ability to earn their own livelihood. He commanded a large building, requisitioned over 100 sewing machines, and got the survivors into the building to work and share the profits of their labors amongst themselves that they should feel self-respect, that they should feel that they are still valued members of society who can contribute to society. He came back to England with exactly one pound. Other people made loads of money and he was a wise and capable person, but he felt that the time that he helped those people, those survivors in the camp. Rabbi Gluck, I'm so sorry to interrupt most you. Important Is it and valuable time in the not Yes. Rabbi Clark, sorry to interrupt you. I'm so sorry to uh, interrupt you mid-flow. Would you mind turning off your camera? Because I think that we're having a few sound issues. So yes, I think sure, it, sure. it will be easier to hear yes, you. Sure, Thank you. Yes, sure. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry about that. Thank you very much. Uh, you, you, please, please continue. I think if we just we want to you, we want you, you to you, continue yes. your story, but yeah, we'll just move your camera off so that we can hear you better. Yes. But please continue. Much Thank you. So Begum, so we have one day in Austria, one day in Bergen Belsen, and we have one day, the twenty fourth of January. 2022, today. In Judaism, we do not have history. We have memory. And like we are told, that we have an obligation to remember the Egyptian exile, which happened thousands of years ago. And it should be a memory between your eyes. What does it mean a memory? And what does it mean between your eyes? A memory means that we relive what happened in the past. We don't see it as history, as something academic, as something which happened in the, in the, in the far distance, in the past, but something which speaks to us today something that we can relate to, something that inspires us, something that teaches us, something that shows us that life can be different and must be different. There should be memory between your eyes. Memory between your eyes means that on the 24th of January, 2022, What happened during the Holocaust, what happened in Bosnia, what happened in Myanmar, what happened in Cambodia, should affect our perspective on society, should affect our perspective how we deal with hatred, with racism, with xenophobia that we are experiencing today on, on the 22nd of January. My mother came over as a 10-year-old child. Her parents and over 100 members of her family were murdered during the Holocaust. Why? Because Britain did not allow them in. This 
חיים. Heroic efforts by my mother and her siblings to facilitate the arrival in this country, finding a job for them. But Britain had closed the doors. Britain in aliens it's, um, we're so sorry, Rabbi Gluck. Um, I'm going to have to um, stop you there. We're having um, problems hearing you. Yeah, so sorry about that. Uh, yeah, we were just struggling uh, with the sound there, Rabbi Gluck. But that, that was amazing. That was... That that was, was because we Thank you, Rabbi Gluck. That was, it was just, sorry that we had to um, stop you. We were just really struggling to hear you, but that was just so um, powerful and, you know, incredible to hear. So thank you so much for um, taking time out to join us this evening. Um, uh, we really thank appreciate you. that. Thank you. Um, so um, I'd now like to welcome um, our final speaker for this evening, um, who is a writer, historian, and an activist with the Jewish Socialist Group, as well as chronicling and teaching the stories of Jewish resistance to fascism and anti-Semitism. He has also played a key role in building unity against the rise of the far right today. He's also one of the organizers of the annual Unite Against Fascism trip to Krakow and Auschwitz. And we are um, so grateful for all the support um, that you show for Stand Up to Racism. So, Please give a, a very warm welcome, and I'm delighted to uh, give um, a warm welcome to David Rosenberg. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm honoured to be here on this platform. Um, Holocaust memorial events enable us to acknowledge and remember who and what was lost to the world, and to learn from individuals' personal experience. The Nazis attempted not only to wipe out a people, but to erase a culture and civilization, Yiddish culture but I'm proud to use the Yiddish words of anti-Nazi resistors, mir velen ze we will outlive them, and mir zeinen do, we are here. Nazism was defeated in 1945, but the authoritarian ethno-nationalist ideas that fueled it are still aimed at various targets in different countries. Our responsibility is to build an inclusive, united resistance to those ideas today, and draw inspiration from those who fought fascism before us. The Holocaust happened in the real world, within a capitalist system that reduced human beings to enslaved disposable units of production, creating profits for companies that developed and packaged poison gas. This economic system channeled the skills of trained architects, engineers, scientists, physicians, administrators, to create factories of death that deprive the world of talents and potential of millions of other human beings whom they labeled inferior. That's my analytical framework, but my focus tonight is on resistance and the creators of memory, knowledge and hope, and hope through collective action. In 1987, I attended a conference in New York of around 50 participants marking the 90th anniversary of the Jewish Socialist Bund, which together with the Polish Socialist Party um, led the physical and ideological struggles against Poland's far-right forces of the 1930s. Um, um, and I met, I met survivors there who had been ghetto resistors and partisans. In one session, we heard from Vladka Mead, a quietly spoken woman, whose mother, brother and sister were among more than 900,000 Jews and 2,000 Romani gypsies murdered at Treblinka, a number exceeded only by Auschwitz, whose liberation we mark this week. 
Vladka joined the Bund's youth movement in Warsaw at 14. In her early 20s, she was part of a network, mainly women, who collectively known as couriers, who lived beyond the ghetto with false papers. They traveled around Poland under the Nazis' noses, smuggling themselves in and out of ghettos, delivering forged identity cards, messages, underground newspapers, and later guns, grenades, and other weapons. The resistance fighter Marek Edelman remarked, most importantly, she delivered hope to those people walled off from the world. I have a 90 year old friend in London who owes her life to Polish Catholic families who hid her after she and her twin sister were smuggled out of the Warsaw Ghetto. But she also owes it to Vladka who visited regularly and made payments to those hiding her. The Jewish Historical Institute in Warsaw has a permanent exhibition today celebrating Emanuel Ringelblum, who, led a a co who co led a network of mutual aid societies un organizing underground soup kitchens and secret educational and cultural initiatives. But above all, the exhibition highlights an underground research project he shouted, he, he founded, calling itself Oineg Shabbos, Society for the Pleasure of the Sabbath. 12 co-workers documented and archived what was happening to the Jews under, in the ghetto under Nazi occupation. And they had contact with around 60 others who to protect the secrecy of the operation knew very few of the others. They distributed questionnaires and notebooks and collected them. When mass, deport, when mass deportations began in July, 1942, they recorded the destruction of the people and sent that information out of Poland through clandestine routes. Its archive materials were buried in metal boxes and milk churns. History, they say, is written by victors, but here it is described by the victims on the eve of destruction. Researchers are still making new insights based on their, those archives. The first cache was unearthed in 1946, the second in 1950. Rachel Oyerbach was one of the few members of the project who survived, and she said there was a third cache that has still not been found. One of the people who buried the, the, the archive, 19 year old David Graber, was killed in Treblinka, but his message survived with the material. And it said, what we were unable to shout out to the world, we hid underground. May this treasure end up in good hands. May it live to see better times. May it alert the world. The most significant physical resistance by Jews during the Holocaust took place over three to four weeks in the Warsaw Ghetto, but less prolonged acts of collective rebellion inspired by Warsaw's example, informed by messages from couriers, took place in many ghettos, labor camps, concentration camps, even death camps. The April 43 uprising in Warsaw built on an earlier act of rebellion whose anniversary just passed. In January, 1943, the Nazis resumed their mass deportation program, but were assailed by gunfire from four different barricaded positions organized by a united fighting body comprising Bundes, communists and left-wing Zionists. That body's ammunition was boosted by a small donation of 10 pistols from the Polish Home Army, but the Nazis had to cut short their action. A few days later, Poland's Home Army smuggled in 50 pistols and 55 hand grenades to the fighters, which were used in April. I want to finish with one more example of mutual aid in 1943 and comment on solidarity actions in Poland today. Um, a Bund activist, Bernard Goldstein, describes the ghetto population and fighters organization making collective preparations for their final struggle. He says, we concentrated on building bunkers, hiding places for men and supplies, groups of inhabitants in tenements or in neighboring tenements organized, collected money and hired engineers and technicians to supervise the building. The bunkers took various forms, sometimes a double wall parallel to the old one with enough room between for two or several people to wait out a raid. Access might be through an old wardrobe. Uh, its side might be lifted, one allowing one person at a time to crawl into the corridor between the walls. Sometimes the bunker was a double cellar. Um, in some of the double cellars, there were crude ventilation systems installed and connections for electricity and water. Tunnels were dug to, 
to connect one courtyard to another. Passage passages were connected through cellars and the attics, um, a communication system which was of great strategic value during the ghetto uprising. The entire ghetto worked with singleness of purpose in the conviction that the final battle of annihilation was inevitable. Contrast that cooperation, that mutual aid with the Nazi system of using people's education and skills to build death factories. Anti-racists in Poland today are challenging not only fascist groups, but also racist state forces who have built a militarized zone on the Poland Belarus border to keep out mainly black and brown asylum seekers. 14 Polish NGOs have united with, within Grupa Granica to help and support asylum seekers who get through. It was really heartening to read an activist explaining that they campaign today because they knew their grandparents had helped Jews secretly in the 1940s. Last point, in 1948, Vlad Kamid wrote a book in Yiddish, which was translated into English in 1972. It was called On Both Sides of the Wall. And um, it's a harrowing account of resistors and collaborators, courage and betrayal, and many who were simply bystanders who witnessed terrible injustices, but did not intervene. And our job as anti-racists and anti-fascists must be to turn bystanders into upstanders. Thank you. Thank you, David, for that. That was always a pleasure, pleasure to hear from you. Um, and thank you again for um, joining us this evening. We do have another speaker. Uh, apologies. I think I said before um, David spoke when I introduced him that uh, he's our final speaker. Um, he's not. We've got one more speaker and um, I'm very pleased to um, introduce him. He is the um, co-convener of Sanitary Racism along with myself. Um, so um, I'd like to introduce Wayman Bennett. I'd like to start off by thanking all the uh, previous speakers. I want to thank David, who's a, a long time campaigner and goes every year with us to Auschwitz. To um, He hasn't been able to go because of the terrible pandemic at the moment, but we will be resuming that. I want to thank Rabbi Gluck, especially for standing on every roundabout opposing fascists today, as well as remembering all the opposition that's taken place. I want to thank Ruth, and I'm very proud to have stood next to her, her, her uncle on many demonstrations who never stopped fighting and never stopped speaking. I want to thank Daniela for speaking out for what happened at the Roma, and above all, I want to thank uh, uh, Colette, and her sister, who survived the attempt on the course, and I want to remember her father, um, Solomon uh, Levi, as well. Levi. Uh, Levi um, um, because one of the reasons why I want to remember them is because I think Stand Up to Racism and Unite Against Fascism would not be here if it wasn't for the resistance and tradition that was carried by other people. And I want to remember some of those names. There's a man called Henry Guterman to help to set up and fight what happened inside. Uh, he was from the kinder transport. We wouldn't be here if he didn't talk about a tradition of unity. I want to talk, thank Leon Greenman, who's no longer here, who was also a survivor from Auschwitz, who did every meeting as much as he could. And the last, last thing, one last thing he said to me was, all I want you to do is carry on the tradition. I also want to thank Honey Rosenberg, who um, paid for every, stage that we had despite her in terms of sadly died last year and I, I, the reason why I want to bring this up is because the message that we that we say there's a message that says never again and when you go to Auschwitz there's a sign up there and it says those by Santana it says those people that forget the past are doomed to repeat it today mm -hmm. and I think that was a profound lesson the, in, the difference about the holocaust was the industrialized killing that's what makes it unique um, and carried out by a group of people that was organized politically by the Nazis. And I, I think that one of the reasons why every year we have to make sure that we remember the Holocaust is because there's others. I remember people like um, Le Pen who said that it's one small detail in history. They only say that in order to repeat it. And I think that what we're, you know, in my final words, what I'm trying to talk about is really a tradition of resistance, a resistance against anti-Semitism, Islamophobia and racism. Um, and we are going to carry that on 
um, because we won't be silenced by those forces that seek, uh, seek to defeat us. And I think that unity and that solidarity is the weapon that, that, that we, br we, bring, we, we bring today. Um, we're going to have longer talks with um, Colette. There's many things that she just takes for granted in terms of her survival, which I think as an eight-year-old, an eight-and-a-half-year-old, we wouldn't have, you know, many of us wouldn't be able to survive and would have suffered trauma so that we're recording this as part of the tradition of Stand Up to Racism. But I would like to invite everybody to march against anti-Semitism, Islamophobia and racism on the 19th of March um, in London, in Glasgow and Cardiff, because we need to join an international tradition that's marching all over Europe against those very things and the world to say that when we say never again, we actually mean it. And, um, and the, the final thing I'd like to say is that tradition has, that has had made a difference. Um, people like Tommy Robinson lost their livelihood or whatever it is because we marched against those people, the little Hitlers of today. I'm glad to say we destroyed the British National Party. I'm glad to say that we broke the National Front when they tried to march. I'm glad to say we destroyed the black shirts, but that for us is a lesson about why we have to carry on the tradition of anti-fascism and to the idea that you can break the Nazis because at the end of the day, when they try and divide us, what they're trying to do is smash every form of democratic institutions that exist inside of society. And therefore is a necessity for us to bring together the maximum unity in order to defeat them. So the final thing I wanna say is just thank all the speakers Thank the people for listening and remember the people that have fought before us because that's the tradition that we're standing and we won't be silenced. And I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Wayman. And thank you to all of our speakers um, who joined us today. It was just so powerful to hear from all of you, especially those who have got um, uh, first-hand um, stories of what happened during the Holocaust and those who um, escaped um, the Nazis. Um, so thank you all for your contribution today. Um, we do have um, uh, many events coming up. Um, so on the 5th of February, Saturday the 5th of February, there's a trade union conference, which is another opportunity to um, discuss the importance of um, opposing um, anti-Semitism and obviously fighting uh, racism in the workplace. And as Raymond said, we've got a big march on Saturday, the 19th of March in London and Glasgow. And then on Sunday, the 20th of March, um, there's a demonstration in Cardiff. And those demonstrations on the 19th and 20th of March are to mark UN Anti-Racism Day. So again, that's a big opportunity to remind everyone of the importance of opposing anti-Semitism um, and all forms of racism and fascism. Um, so thank you all um, for joining us. Thank you to everyone who tuned in today. And um, remember, Holocaust Memorial Day is on Thursday, the 27th of January. Um, so um, please, um, please remember that day and um, ensure that we do all we can to fight racism and fascism. Thank you. Thank you.